By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim? Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today we have a nice old school magic match for you. We've got two decks that are built around enchantments. And they're both from the same set as well. They're built around enchantments from Legends. Now I am taking on Gamer J, also known as J. Uh, and he is a brand new patron. Welcome to the channel, uh, Jay. I really appreciate your support. And he is playing an Underworld Dreams deck. So it's really going for it. I believe it's mainly red and black, but more about that in the deck deck section of the video. And I'm playing against him with my Tax Edge deck. So that's build around Land Tax and Lance Edge. And again, I'm going to show you my list in a moment in the deck deck section. Before I jump to that, though, I would first like to point out that as always, you can also choose to skip that part of the video, maybe check out the deck decks afterwards. I know some people prefer to do that. The easiest way to do this is by checking out the description below because there you will find several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. Click on there, it'll take you straight to the games. And in that same uh, description, you can also find information about the rule set. So if you care about that stuff, today we are playing according to the Swedish rules with an open reprint policy. That means no Fallen Empires and no Mana Burn and just one strip and a lot of really cool cards from 93, 94. You know, this is one of my favorite formats to play. So I'm always excited to uh, to play some Swedish. And in that same description, by the way, you can find a link to my Patreon page, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. And you can find out how you can become a patron of the show just uh, like Jay did last month. And then, you know, who knows, maybe we can make an episode together as well. So check that out on uh, patreon.com slash Timmy Talks. Okay, now that you're fully informed, I'm gonna start with the deck decks and I'm actually gonna start with my deck, Tex Edge. Let's take a look. And here we see my deck, Tex Edge. So this deck is built around two key cards. And like I said in the introduction, they have something to do with enchantment. So the first card is an enchantment from Legends for one white to cast land tax. And it reads, at the beginning of your upkeep, and I'm reading the current Oracle text, by the way, at the beginning of your upkeep, if an opponent controls more lands than you, you may search your library for up to three basic land cards to reveal them and put them in your into your hand and then shuffle. So, you know, if my opponent has more lands than me, I can get a lot of basics. That's basically what's going to happen, right? A lot of basic lands in my hand. Now, what am I going to do with all those lands? Well, that is where Disenchantment comes in, Lance Edge. So Lance Edge is a world enchantment for two red and one that reads, discard a card. If the discarded card was a land card, Lance Edge deals two damage to target player or planeswalker. Any player may activate this ability. So this is kind of risky, right? If you're kind of low on life and your opponent may have a couple of lands in hand, you know, he can throw them to you and you can also take damage because this enchantment counts for both players. So you really have to time it right. Now, besides this strategy, I also have another strategy in the deck and that is the Wrath of God strategy. So Wrath of God is of course the famous sorcery two white and two that buries all creatures. And that works really well with the creatures in my deck because I'm only playing with creatures that are actually not really creatures. I'm playing with Jade Statue, which is just an artifact until you activate it and then it becomes a three six, six creature. And I'm playing with Mishra's Factory, of course, the famous land, which is just a land until you make it into a factory worker. So the synergy here is quite basic, right? I'm gonna play my Wrath of God, kill all the creatures on the board, but hey, I don't have any. And then after that, I'm gonna animate my Jade Statue, animate my factory worker, and just go in and attack, you know? So I've got two strategies, and I kind of believe they go hand in hand. I do need some mana, of course, to cast the Jade Statue and to, and to activate it. So I know that a lot of players tend to combine Tex Edge with a really low to the ground kind of white weenie strategy, you know, with uh, Iron Claw Oryx, with Savannah Lions. But I thought let's try another route and combine this Wrath of God strategy with Land Tex and Lance Edge. Now, um, there's also something special happening in the sideboard because main board I'm playing creatureless, but in the sideboard I've got creatures. I've got uh, Granite Gargoyles and I've got Sarah Angels. So if I've shown my Land Tex, Lance Edge combination already in game one, I'm probably going to board some stuff out and I'm gonna board creatures in hoping that my opponent, of course, is going to board out all of his creature removal and maybe change it with, you know, disenchants, cards like that, you know, cards that can hit enchantments and artifacts, since I've got Jade Statue and two Jam Day Tomes, and of course, I've got the enchantment. So you want to get rid of those, right, after game one, especially if you've seen them in action. So then I'm going to make a swap. 
Hopefully my opponent has boarded out like cards like Swords to Plowshares or, you know, Lightning Bolt, stuff like that. And, uh, you know, then my creatures can kind of roam free in game two. And then what am I going to do in game three? Well, that's the big surprise, right? Am I going to turn everything back or am I going to keep the creatures in? That's always kind of funny with these uh, transformational sideboards, as you call them. But um, yeah, that's kind of my deck in a nutshell. Let me know in the comments below what you think about it. And now let's take a look at the deck of my opponent. And here we see the deck of Gamer J. So this deck is built completely around the card Underworld Dream. So this is an enchantment from Legends, three black to cast. It reads, whenever an opponent draws a card, which is me in this case, Underworld Dreams deals one damage to that player. So what you want to do with a in a deck like this, you want to just have a lot of cards that force your opponent to draw cards. And guess what he has? He's got a lot of cards that do that. I think... One of the ones that I like the most here is Winds of Change because it's just one red. It's so efficient. One red for a sorcery, also from Legends, that reads, each player shuffles the cards from their hand into their library, then draws that many cards. So if he's got an Underworld Dreams on the table and I've got seven cards in hand and he plays Winds of Change, I've got to shuffle my hand back in my library, draw seven cards, so I take seven damage. So you can see how quickly this can get out of hand. What if he has two Underworld Dreams? I take 14 damage. Like decks like this, can be super explosive. When they go off, you can die, man. This is a deck that can potentially win like in turn one or turn two, you know. Of course, it doesn't happen often, but when you have the right components, bam. And also this deck, it is fully powered. So he's got the pieces. Cards like uh, a Wheel of Fortune, cards like Time Twister, they're also really good in this deck. Howling Mine, of course, is really good in this deck because Howling Mine means I take two points of damage. And of course, when you've got all this card draw going on, Black Vice, which is also in the, in the deck, is also really good, you know, because your opponent, again, me, has to <laughs> take a damage for every card above four. So if I've got seven cards in hand, the Vice is going to deal three points of damage. So I'm just taking damage left, right, and center. Like, this is really risky. I'm super happy that I'm playing with a wide deck because at least I've got access to Disenchants, you know, to try to time them right and kind of take out all those nasty enchantments and artifacts that are that are in this deck. Uh, what I like about this deck, by the way, well, actually, I like the whole deck. I think Underworld Dreams is just a cool card, and building a deck around uh, a card is always, in my opinion, like a cool thing to do. Um, one of the things I like about this deck, now let me put it that way, is that he can create what I call a blue fireball. He can he can make a brain geyser, play a brain geyser, force me to draw cards, and if he does that while he has an Underworld Dreams in play, I'm actually taking a damage right for every card that I draw, which is kind of funny. And he can also make a blue lightning bolt, and the way that works is you cast Ancestral Recall, of course, on your opponent, you force your opponent to draw three cards while you have the Underworld Dreams on the table, meaning you deal three points of damage at instant speed, just like a Lightning Bolt. But what if you've got multiple Underworld Dreams? You can deal six, nine, even 12 points of damage if you've got all four Underworld Dreams on the table. Now, does that happen often? No. Is that funny? Yes. So I hope, <laughs> I hope, Gamer J, you're going to do that uh, in this match. But you don't see that often. Uh, but that would make a really cool video. Uh, then when we're looking at the sideboard here with Gamer J, we see a few cards that could be really handy for him. I think the two, two disenchants can be absolutely golden, you know, take out my edge or my tax. And of course, he can also aim the disenchants at my jade statues or my factories. So that's pretty good. Also, I think Nevernerl's disc could be useful, of course. He also has a lot of permanence on the battlefield, but if he can time his disc right, it could be fantastic against me. And also the glooms could be quite useful. They can kind of slow me down, especially with those disenchants. And I'm really going to need those disenchants if I'm looking at this list. It's looking it's looking mighty powerful. So uh, first off, thank you, Gamer J, for bringing it to the table. But I'm also a little bit scared. Okay, keeping my fingers crossed, we've looked at the deck of Gamer J. We've looked at my deck. That means we're ready. Let's go to the match. Game number one, here we go. So I'm on the play playing with my red and white Lantex Lance Edge deck. Starting here with a Mox Pearl and a Mishra's Factory. That's a pretty good start. Next turn, I can uh, attack for two, perhaps. Let's see what Gamer J is going to do. Also a Mox Pearl. Nice. And a Swamp. And what else does he have here? Going to tap the Pearl. There's a soul ring. That is pretty good. Tapping the soul ring. Wow. He's almost going to play out his entire hand here. There's a howling mine and a black vice. That is a pretty sweet opening for him. The howling mine, of course, is going to help him refill his hand and, uh, and try to find that underworld dreams. There is a disenchant, though. I wonder what I'm going to disenchant. Going to go here for the vice. 
So I'm a little bit worried. Taking care of the vice, going down to four, and I'm going to draw two cards. And I'm going to go back up to six. There's a planes. Ooh, for my own soul ring. Wow, tapping four. There's a jade statue. Okay, so actually, I've got a really good turn two here. Only three cards in hand. And uh, passing the turn here. So next turn, I can start swinging in with the jade statue and perhaps also with the factory, dealing five points of damage a turn. Let's first see what Gamer J can do. Drawing, of course, two cards because of that Howling Mine. Let's see if he can find his Underworld Dreams. Now, at this stage of the game, of course, we both don't really know what we're playing. So we're trying to kind of identify what the opponent wants to do. There we see two Moxen, by the way, Mox Ruby and a Mox Jet. Doesn't have three black yet. Seems like he's uh, not having a land in hand. He's got enough mana, but remember, Underworld Dreams is three black to cast. He's got three cards in hand at the moment. And he's just passing the turn. So I'm going to draw two cards here from the mine. Going to go back up to five. Now the question is, am I going to cast some stuff or am I going to attack here? Looks like I'm going to animate the statue. And also animate the factory swinging in for five. Wow. And look at that Gamer J not having a Swords or a Disenchant. Taking five damage here, dropping to 15, playing out a Mountain, passing the turn. So, I mean, this Mountain surprises me a little bit because what if I later in the game draw into a land text? It's going to be harder for me to activate it. There we see a Badlands, by the way, by uh, Gamer J. Perhaps he's got the mana now to play Underworld Dreams, but I guess he doesn't have it in hand, casting... A winds of change here. So we're going to shuffle up. And I'm going to draw four new cards. And Jay is going to draw three new cards off of that winds of change. And I mean, he still has three black open. So if he can find the Underworld Dreams, he can cast it straight away. I mean, that's of course what his deck wants to do. The whole deck is built around this key enchantment. And I don't know about you, but whenever I build a deck around a card, I tend to never see it. Like, I remember for Jiren Enchantress's decks where I just, everything in my deck is built around that card and I just don't see it. So, I wonder if Jay can, uh, can find his Underworld Dreams. I really do hope so. It looks like he's just passing though, so cannot find the components he needs. And uh, I need to draw two cards here. I believe I only drew one card, but... Perhaps I'm mistaken. Anyway, playing out a strip mine, stripping the Badlands, and animating and attacking again. So look at that, putting Jay on 10. So I've half this life here. And I mean, this is rough, right? Even, I mean, remember his deck list. I, I believe he's not playing with Swords. He's playing with the Abyss instead. And if he finds the Abyss, you know, it's not really going to solve the issue. Because it only works on uh, non-artifact creatures, of course. So there we see a City of Brass. And a pass turn again. So Jay not really finding the components. I only, only need two more swings to win this game. There is another factory. And of course, I can use that to pump the other one. So animating, pumping it up. Six points of damage. He's dropping to four. This looks like a very uh, quick... Game number one, passing the turn here back, and nope, cannot find what he needs, showing what he has here on the table, and uh, yeah, even at another bolt as well, and uh, it happens, you know, this is the thing when you build these decks around four key cards, you need to draw the key cards, and uh, I feel that uh, Jay was very unlucky in this match. Well, this first game, because the match is still going on, of course. So we are going to shuffle up, dive into our sideboards, and we are going to catch back up with you in game number two. Game number two, here we go. Gamer J starting here. What's that card? Lots of glare. Okay, Underground C, and a Mox Ruby here, turn one. Are we going to see perhaps a Howling Mine or a Vice? Nope, just a pass turn. I believe also J took a Mulligan, by the way, so he started with six. And uh, there's a plateau. 
And again, my mocks, finding my mocks pearl again. So six in hand here and passing the turn. And there is a swamp. Okay. What's going to happen? It looks like he needs a moment. He's tapped to swamp still. Are we going to see a dark ritual perhaps? Yeah, I believe. Yep, there's a dark ritual. Three black in the pool. And there's a winds of change. Okay, I like his style here. So he's saying, you know, I'm going to put the three in and I'm just going to count on drawing in underworld dreams. Now remember, we are playing according to the Swedish rules, which means we have no mana burn. So this is kind of a free gamble. If you would play another format with mana burn, it would be, uh, there would be some stakes. He could uh, deal three damage to himself with this play. But I like it. So drawing three cards again. Remember, three black in the pool. Let's see if he can find an Underworld Dreams here. It would be kind of cool. Okay, so at least he found a Chaos Orb, so he can do something with the mana. Could even flip here if he wants to. Nope, choosing to pass the turn instead. And let's see what I can do. So drawing a card, going back up to seven cards in hand, I believe. Playing a Plains. It's always annoying, by the way, when you're playing against an opponent who has a Chaos Orb on the table. I don't know how you feel about that, but you always have to think about what you're going to play out. Is this a target for the Chaos Orb? You know, of course, in my case, it's also, do I have a Disenchant in hand? Do I want to keep that mana open to, in, in response, Disenchant if I play something out? So I'm really taking my time here, probably trying to decide what I want to do. Okay, look at that, tapping out a Stone Rain. Okay, going uh, here for the Underground Sea. And I mean, that's the thing, if you kind of know, you think your opponent is on the Underworld Dreams plan, because it's three black, you can try to start kind of focusing on that, making sure that he cannot reach the three black in this case. So uh, there's a Batlands, by the way, being played out by Jay, and then a pass turn to me, playing a Plateau. What's interesting is I'm, ag again, not really finding my, my land text here, it seems. Or else I'm sure I would have played the game a little bit differently. Passing the turn here back to Jay. And I think the big difference here is if we compare it with game one is that I'm unable to put pressure on the board. You know, that's something that I did very quickly on in game number one. Now here in game two, I cannot find anything to put pressure on the life total of Jay. So despite the fact that Jay can again not find his key components, it doesn't really hurt him that much because I simply don't have anything to deal damage to. We're both still on 20. We're kind of, you know, drawing and go. Five cards in hand, passing to turn back. There's a City of Brass. So he's got access to three black now. Let's see if he can do anything with it. Ooh, he's going to tap though. He's going to take a damage from the city. What are we going to see? Hey, there is the Underworld Dreams. That is nice. And there's a quick disenchant though. You kind of notice usually when you're playing against uh, a player who has access to white, if they don't do anything, it probably means their hand's kind of full of answers. In this case, perhaps disenchants and divine offerings. Tapping four here. Okay, there's a gem they told. And that makes that disenchant even more important here. So disenchanted the underworld dreams, then played my gem they told. This is kind of a target, I think, for Jay here, if he wants you to flip on the tome. Then again, he wants me to draw cards, so I can also imagine that he's not gonna go to, uh, gonna do that, and just hope that he's gonna find another dreams. Going through the graveyard, so perhaps he's got, he is playing with a recall, but for recall he needs two blue, I believe. Or, oh no, only one blue, of course, and the double X. So I think he's going to cast a recall here. Going to take a damage. And, oh, he's going to play a regrowth, of course. He's got access to green as well. That makes much more sense. 
There's a dark rich always going to play it straight away. Okay, okay, Jose. The dreams hits the board again. And that means some damage for me, so I'm going to drop to 19. And what can I do here? And yeah, you can see Jay kind of being happy, like, finally, I got my dreams. It sticks to the board. Playing out a, uh, a soul ring here. And of course, that soul ring is really good with the tome on the, on the battlefield. I mean, I'm not too concerned yet about the dreams. Then again, I mean, if he starts finding like draw sevens, like if he can draw into Wheel of Fortune or Time Twister, that would be golden for, uh, for Jay. And he would deal tons of damage and he would refill his hand. But it looks like he's just passing the turn. So on end step, I'm drawing an extra card with the Tome. Of course, dealing a damage to myself because of the Dreams. Taking another damage for my draw for turn. So I'm, on, I'm now on 17. And I need to find something to put pressure on. And okay, here we go. Playing Granite Gargoyle. So I did port in some creatures after game one. So this is the 2-2 two -two Flyer. And for one red, I can give it plus uh, zero plus one. So I can pump its toughness. So at least I can start, you know, slowly attacking. I wonder now if, uh, if Jay is going to use his Chaos Orb here. Putting the dice on my deck, not to forget the uh, Underworld Dreams trigger, by the way. So I'm still on 17. And Jay's thinking about it. Do I want to use the Chaos Orb now, perhaps on the flyer? What is he going to do? Could, of course, decide to first draw and then, you know, have some more information. I wonder if he kept in the Abyss after sideboard. We'll just have to wait and see. He's going to take a damage here from the City of Brass. Drop to 17. And, okay, there's a Sylvan Library. That is really good. That can help him to draw more. Find the, part, the components he needs. Now he's still on 17, so... He can uh, also draw some extra cards with the library, I guess. Now I'm taking another damage because of my Tome activation on end step here. And taking my turn, taking another damage, so dropping to 15. Can I find more creatures? I wonder if I also boarded in the, uh, the Sarah Angels. I'm right now trying to dig in my memory, but I, th I think after... The first game that I only boarded in the Gargoyles and not yet the Sarah Angels. Perhaps I did that later. Ooh, there's a Ivory Tower. That Ivory Tower is quite good, actually. That can get me uh, back, my life total back up. I still have six cards in hand, so that means two life next turn. Actually, if I use the Tome on end step, that's three life. And that can really compensate for the life loss from the uh, Underworld Dreams. This is really a card that Jay doesn't want to see. Again, a target for the uh, Chaos Orb to flip on. But first, he's going to look at his uh, three cards because of the uh, Sylvan Library. So he can look at the top three cards, put them in any order, and then uh, draw one of them. And if he wants, he can draw an additional card, up to two cards in total. So he can draw three cards if he wants to. But he has to pay four life for each extra card drawn. Look at that, taking an extra card. Dropping to 11. So I wonder what cards he, uh, he drew here. A Mox Jet. Tapping the Jet. Looks like he's also tapping the Ruby. Ooh, is that perhaps an, uh, a Wheel of Fortune? A Wheel would be quite good. That means 7 points of damage for me. I would uh, drop to 8. Changing his mind though, just tapping the jet for a vice. And what is he going to do now? Tapping again, Batlands, Ruby, and a Swamp. Are we going to see a wheel? No, we're going to see a Gloom. Okay, I'm actually happy that it's just a Gloom. I was really worried for a Wheel of Fortune. On end step, I'm going to draw a card. Going to take an extra damage. Going to drop here to 14. Remember, I do have the tower, but the tower and the black vice, they kind of cancel each other out. So I'm gaining life from the tower, losing life to the vice. 
So nothing really happens. I'm just going to stay on 14, it seems. And then uh, I think that's what we're discussing now as well. And then, of course, I'm going to take a damage for drawing the card for turn. That's, of course, from the Underworld Dreams. Attacking here for two, so I'm going to put him on nine. And it looks like I'm tapping a red and two again. Another Gargoyle. Okay, this is really good. Kind of forcing Jay here to, at a certain point, start using that Chaos Orb. Because that means four damage next turn. He's already on nine. He would drop to five in that case. And remember, I am playing with four lightning bolts as well. So you really don't want to get too low. I feel like perhaps, you know, Jay took out the abysses and now he's regretting it because of those uh, gargoyles. Playing a mountain here. Six cards in hand. And it looks like I'm passing the turn here to, uh, to Jay. Yep, passing the turn. He's untapping. He's on nine. Of course, he can look at the top three cards because of the Sylvan. Last turn, he took an extra card, so he can look at two new cards this turn. But it's going to be really tough for him to keep drawing extra cards because he's on, uh, on nine, and I've got four power in the air coming at him next turn. So just picking one card here that makes, uh, makes perfect sense. And I am wondering if he's going to flip the Chaos Orb. There's a Volcanic Island. And I actually think because I played out the Mountain, that means I've got enough mana to cast a Disenchant. I'm kind of signaling to Jay that perhaps I have it. Remember, there's a Gloom on the table, so I've got to pay three extra per white spell. And I've got exactly five mana available. So it's exactly a disenchant. And now, of course, I've got the decision. He's passing the turn. So I am using the Tome. So now in response to his activation, Jay could consider using the Chaos Orb, knowing that I can no longer cast the disenchant. If I have that in hand, of course, perhaps I'm pretending to have it in hand. Anyway, taking my turn here. First a damage from the Tome, then drawing for turn. Or perhaps I already took a damage from the Tome. Anyway, I'm on 11, it seems, and attacking for 4 through the air. There we see the activation of the Orb. Now let's see if I have that Disenchant. Do I? Do I have? We wants to flip. Look at that tapping 5. Yeah, I think I've got the Disenchant here. Yep, yeah, there it is. There's the Disenchant. That is unfortunate. A nice thing to note, by the way, that this was Jay's first uh, online match. So this was the first time he played through the internet. And uh, he's like so many of us, one of those players that started playing in, in 94, 95, had all the cards, stopped for a long time, and now just uh, got back into it. And uh, like I said, it was, it was a really nice guy. He's got a lot of love for, for old school magic. Obviously, when you look at his, uh, his collection. But unfortunately, I'm sorry, Jay, I had to disenchant the Chaos Orb. I feel kind of bad about it because it would have been your first flip online. But it wasn't meant to be. And of course, he is taking damage. Oh, look at that. I'm even finishing game number two here with a double lightning bolt. Oh, I thought, I thought Jay had like one more turn. At least uh, he got the Underworld Dreams to stick this time. Don't go away yet because we did play game number three. So if you want to see more of these decks, stick around. Game number three, here we go. And of course, Jay is still on the player after losing the second one. And I think that's another underground C. It's kind of hard to see. Starting with the plateau, myself and a land tax. Okay, finally found a land tax. So maybe I can show you my, because remember, that's the idea of my deck, right? Land tax, lands edge. I haven't really shown that uh, that side of the deck yet, so maybe I get a chance to show it to you here in game number three. And there we see Gamer J tapping two here. There's a Howling Mine. And then now I'm, I can draw tons of cards because I can activate my tax. Two lands there for J. That's exactly what I'm going to do. And then after that, I need to draw two cards as well because of the, uh, the Howling Mine. Now, important to note here is that the cards you get from the land text don't count as actually drawing cards. So even if you would have had uh, an Underworld Dreams in play, 
I could still use my land text without taking any damage. Anyway, picking up two planes and a mountain, now drawing for turn, meaning I've got 10 cards in hand, I believe. So let's see if I can uh, dump some cards or maybe just discard a lot of cards here. What could be interesting is if I have a lance edge and just start throwing land straight away. Ooh, there we see a divine offering taking care of the howling mine. And remember, divine offering card that came in from the sideboard, I believe. That's going to give me two extra life as well. So I'm going to go up to 22. And now I believe I have to start discarding some cards. So, or not, or do I have seven? Probably have to discard a card, right? Maybe that's why I'm taking my time here. Probably just dropping a basic, exactly basic planes past turn. Yep, that makes sense. Let's see what Jay can do. And this is, of course, the risk with the Howling Mine. Um, you know, if you play it, your opponent will benefit from it first. And then it always has this opening to draw the extra card, then destroy your mine. Which feels kind of bad. You know, I've, I've got a few decks with Howling Mine because it, it's such a cool card. It's, it's fantastic. But it's so annoying when your opponent does that. There's a City of Brass. Gonna tap two again, perhaps another Howling Mine. No Dark Ritual. And okay, there's the Abyss. So that card came back into the deck. And I believe I did keep my creatures in. I actually boarded in extra Sarah Angels in game three because I don't know if you remember, but game two went so slow. So I wanted to put more pressure cards in my deck. And now I can actually activate the tax if I want to, but it looks like I'm not doing it though. Oh, I am doing it. Okay, for a moment there, I thought I wasn't going to do it. So I can find three more basics. Of course, I can also choose to only find one or two. Ooh, picking up a plateau there, <laughs> realizing that you cannot take out duels. I mean, then, then land text would even be more sick. It's already like a sick card. It's so extremely good. But if you could also pick uh, your dual lands, it would be, it would be, wow. It would be so overpowered. So now I already had seven in hand. So three basics makes 10 and drawing for a turn. So 11 cards in hand. And remember, I mean, I don't really want to play out any creatures with the abyss here on the battlefield. I first need to find another disenchant to, uh, to take care of it. Okay, there's the disenchant. So that's, uh, that's good news for me taking care of the abyss. There's a strip mine. Ooh, look at that. Am I going to strip the city of brass here? I am. Wow, and this is rough for Jay. I'm really kind of taking care of his, uh, his key cards here. Discarding two lands, it seems. A mountain and a plains. Now, this is also kind of risky because remember... I still need some basics to throw at him with my, uh, with my lance edge. So if I discard all my lands, that's not a good strategy as well. Anyway, let's first see what Jay can do. While I am uh, sorting my graveyard there, it seems. There's a strip mine. Is he going to strip the plateau? He is. So he's stripping the plateau here. And then passing the turn back to me. Three cards in hand for Jay. Hasn't really been able to do much after uh, I took care of that Howling Mine. I think that was a card that he really needed. Looks like I'm only picking up two lands here. So I'm being a little bit more conservative. Going for the two and drawing a card for turn. So that means, again, ten cards in hand. Let's see if, he can, uh, if I can find a Gargoyle. Like a land and a Gargoyle would be quite good in this scenario. I'm secretly kind of hoping still to just, you know, draw my land's edge and kind of show you what the deck wants to do. But I guess I'm, I, maybe it's not meant to be. Anyway, casting my Granite Gargoyle here, 2-2 two, two Flyer. And discarding my balance. Is that a balance? Yes, that's a balance. Wow, discarding the balance. Perhaps realizing it's not really good in the current board state. There's a vice. This black vice is kind of good. This is really nasty for me. Remember, I mean, I want to use my tax, which is really not working while the vice is, uh, is online. I've got seven in hand, so I'm going to take three damage at least. 
Am I also going to use the tax? That's the question. I'm not. Look at that. Taking the damage. Going to go down to 19. Drawing just a card for turn. Not using the land tax. Interesting. Attacking here for two. So I'm going to put J here on 18. Finally dealing some damage. I mean, my deck is not the best in putting pressure on, right? <laughs> it's, it's so slow. In that regard, game one was really an exception, you know, when I had that uh, factory and the Jade statue online so quick. Passing the turn back to J here, by the way. Seven cards in hand. So I'm going to take three points of damage again next turn from the Vice. And let's see if J can, uh, can find something here. Perhaps a Swamp and an Underworld Dreams. I mean, I've already played out a Disenchant. There's a Soul Ring. And that's it, it seems. Okay, there's a Bolt on the life total here of Jay. And I'm doing this, of course, because I don't want to take as much damage from the Vice. And I mean, I'm going to target all those Bolts on the life total of Jay anyway. So might as well start doing it if I can save some life in the process as well. Again, not using the, uh, the tax, it seems. Or actually, I can, because I've got three lands and so does Jay. Attacking for two here. Got to put him on 13. Okay, going to tap three. Am I going to play another gar gargoyle? Oh, look at that. Stone rain. Stone raining my own land. Actually, going for the plains. I was pointing at the mountain, right? Anyway, going for the plains. So this is good for me in two ways. Like the first reason is, of course, land tax. It's now guaranteed activated next turn. The second thing is vice. I'm playing out another card of my hand, taking less damage. Now, I am, of course, still on 17, so I don't really have to worry about that yet, but still. Look at that. Tapping quite a lot. What are we going to see here? Of course, Brain Geyser makes perfect sense. So he's going to draw four cards. Yeah, four cards here. That is really good. This could, this could be the turning point in the match. Jay drawing four cards here. I mean, he first, of course, passes the turn. being tapped out. But next turn, who knows? Got to take damage still from the Vice. Shouldn't forget that exactly Jay reminding me here. So got to take two points of damage. Going to go down to 15. Not using the tax again, by the way. That is, it surprises me because I played at Stone Rain to activate the tax, and I'm not using it. Playing another land tax. Okay, what I really need here is that land's edge. So he's now on 10. I've got five cards in hand, passing the turn. So I think for Jay, this really has to be the turn that everything comes together, right? I'm on 15. You know, if he can find the dreams and some kind of draw seven. He does have enough mana to do that, right? He could tap three black, cast an underworld dreams, then keep the volcanic island soul ring untapped. And then he can play like a time twister or wheel of fortune. He can do a lot of damage that way. Badlands. Okay, into dark ritual. What is he going to do with the three black? Look at that. He's tapping so much mana. What is he going to do? There's a Wheel of Fortune. So again, he's doing the trick that he did earlier, putting three black in the mana pool. There were Winds of Change there in hand and a Flash Counter. So drawing seven cards, three black still floating from the Dark Ritual. Can he find the Dreams? For a moment there, I thought he was going to go um, Underworld Dreams and then Wheel of Fortune. Finding two mocks in here, the Ruby and the Pearl. There's the land drop for turn there, another City of Brass. Is that it? That is the big question. Looking at his graveyard, so perhaps he's got a regrowth or a recall in hand. I wonder if he's got, like, if he has a recall, he could consider um, 
you could consider getting the Wheel of Fortune back. Look at that. There's another um, Dark Ritual. I really like how he plays with these Dark Rituals. So he's got five black now in the pool. I wonder what he's going to do. Tapping the Underground Sea. Using two mana here from the Dark Rituals. Okay, there's a Recall. What card is he going to pitch and what card is he going to get? I, I just got this feeling that he's going to get... Uh, okay, pitching the Sylvan. Ooh, that's a good card though. I wonder what the other card is. He's going to find the Wheel. They could cast Wheel of Fortune here. Still keep the three black in the pool. It looks like I want to do something. Okay, yeah, okay. Playing a, a Lightning Bolt for three. Putting Jay here on seven. Probably expecting him to play out the wheel anyway. I guess he's going to do that now, taking another point of damage from his own City of Brass. Of course, he wants to keep the three black for a potential dreams. Ah, of course, he can first take, then later use the City of Brass. Makes more sense. Yeah, this play makes more sense. Then he doesn't take that point of damage. So we're drawing seven cards again. I am kind of liking this, you know. Two Wheel of Fortunes in a row. And Jay is really digging deep to try to find the components here that he needs. Still has two black in the pool. And of course, two untapped City of Brasses. So, I mean, in an ideal scenario, he would have an Underworld Dreams and a Winds of Change. That would be kind of funny. Taking a damage. Oh, Ancestral Recall. He's going to dig even deeper. Come on, I'm rooting for you, Jay. You gotta find this Underworld Dreams. I mean, you've drawn so many cards. There's a Black Lotus. Oh, man. I'm going crazy here. If I still cannot find an, a Dreams after all of this, I don't really don't know what else you can do. Okay, so using the two mana, tapping, taking a damage, going to five. Oh, we're going to see the dreams. Yay, there's the Underworld dreams. I guess I shouldn't be happy, but I am. Because, I mean, he's, he's been working so hard to find that dreams. There's a Winds of Change. Wow. That is so good. That is so good. I mean, wow. Is he going to is he gonna win it here, actually? Um, you know, winds have changed, meaning I draw seven cards. So remember, Underworld Dreams on the table. So I take seven points of damage, going to drop to eight. Then I probably take damage from the vice, drop to five. So I basically have one last turn then to try to, to win this third game. But it is really nice here to see Jay's deck kind of going off and doing its thing. So he's drawing the cards from the winds of change. There's a vice. Oh, still, of course, had the two red floating. So playing a vice. Wow. So I'm going to take six points of damage, right? I'm going to drop to two. Or am I going to empty my hand? Okay, going to play a disenchant. Now I've got a choice to make. Am I going to play it on a vice or am I going to play it on Underworld Dreams? And I think I decided to go for the dreams because, you know, it only... The difference is one damage, or I take four damage, or I take three damage. And I think the Underworld Dreams, you know, his whole deck revolves around it. So that's just a little bit more dangerous for me. So taking care of the Dreams. Now, the good thing for me, the good news is that Jay is completely tapped out. So I don't have to worry about Disenchant or other cards to kind of meddle with what I want to do. So I can untap. The question is, am I going to activate the Land Text? I think if I do, I am. So if I do, I probably have... Um, I probably have the uh, the text, the lance uh, edge in my hand. And of course, I'm going to sequence it in a way that I first take the damage from the vices and then look up the cards with the land text. So that's how I'm going to stack it. So I only take four points of damage. So I drop to four. Still need to do that though. So I'm, technically I'm on four here. I guess we discussed this verbally. 
There's the edge. Do I have an edge? Oh, there's the lance edge. Yeah, yeah. And now I've won the game, right? So now I can just... Exactly. I've got so many lands in hand because of the double tax. Yeah, 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 yeah. So this is what my deck wants to do, right? So managed to do it. And I'm actually quite happy with this game three because we could see that insane turn of Jay where he finally found his underworld dreams and was able to deal some damage with it. He was so close to the victory. But also I got to show you finally a win with land tax and Lance Edge, which is, you know, what I want to do with my deck. But as you could see in game one and two, I also can win on, on combat damage as well from, from that control position. Having access, of course, to the swords, to the dish chance, to the bolts. Anyway, this was the match against uh, Jay. Thank you very much, Jay, for bringing your deck here to the table. And of course, for being a patron of Timmy Talks, check out patreon.com slash Timmy Talks if you would like to know how you can become a patron as well and perhaps play a game against me, you know? And of course, join our Discord, get your name in the ad scroll. There are just a lot of perks that go with becoming a patron. So please consider becoming one. It already starts for $1 a month. And before you go, before you go to the Patreon page, please take a moment to like, comment, and share this video. All these things are free and really help the channel move forward. So uh, this was the episode for today. Thank you for watching and let's go to the end scroll. What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? What shall we do with the drunken sailor? Somebody can see.